Um, yeah, welcome everybody, listeners and viewers to School of Thought Victoria. This is, um, it's an honor to be sitting here with Jeff Hopkins, the principal educator at the Pacific School of Innovation and Inquiry here in Victoria. And I say honor because Jeff, you are on a mission along with other kindreds to really shift the way uh, education is experienced by young people uh, and rippling out to older people as their lives go on. So we've been doing a lot of these podcasts and today we've got uh, Rod Allen with us. Jeff, I want you to, to introduce Rod because you two have worked together for a long time. We have. It's actually pretty interesting doing this this way. I was thinking, you know, if this is if we were going to do a podcast for 45 minutes or so, I could spend the whole thing introducing Rod because he's done so many things. Um, but uh, I mean, Rod has been the superintendent of several school districts. And when I met him, he was a superintendent, but also a, a really um, a member of, of uh, the Superintendents, Superintendents Association in British Columbia, which is a very helpful organization for superintendents. Um, but, but within that organization, Rod was very, very helpful in lots of ways, helping people with uh, using technology and thinking about technology, um, how we approach learning, how we bring people together in positive ways, all kinds of things. Um, so that's how I met him. And then um, uh, he soon thereafter uh, became uh, an ass uh, assistant deputy minister at the Ministry of Education for, mm -hmm. uh, it was about eight years, wasn't it, Rod, that you, yeah. were, that you were doing that? Um, and the job there was no small job. It was uh, to, coming in with a, a very specific task of, um, oh, just transform education. Um, new curriculum, change, change the way we look at education as a, as a province. And so um, I was able to watch Rod go all over the province to virtually every community in the province and uh, have conversations with people about what teaching and learning should look like and what framework we should be using. That work connected Rod also globally to the um, to GELP, the Global Education Leaders Partnership, um, and uh, Rod kind of brought me into that group of people a couple of times where I got to meet some very interesting folks that are having the same kinds of conversations in their respective jurisdictions around the globe, um, and that led to um, the Deeper Learning Dozen that uh, Rod is also a member of now, where it's it's all, almost. Uh, a continuation of that work, but kind of going deeper with districts that are wanting to make major transformations. And the Deeper Learning Dozen is having conversations, but also helping people do that. And I know I'm missing a ton of things, but um, that that's that's uh, sort of how I know Rod. And um, maybe through our conversation, we'll learn even more. We, <laughs> so welcome, Rod. <laughs> welcome, Rod. Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, that's quite an introduction. <laughs> All true. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jeff. We, we, do, we do have some deep roots. Um, uh, to, to be sure, we have been on a journey together uh, with others, but, uh, but we have certainly uh, been in the same canoe for a while. Well, I want to start there. You've been on the, uh, on the same journey. And Rod, I want to ask you why, uh, you know, I know Jeff well, I know why he's on this journey. What is it about education change that, um, that grabs you? Why are you on this journey? Um, maybe while I'm giving myself time to think about an answer to that, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, begin by, um, recognizing that I'm coming to you from couch and territory, the, the, uh, unceded stolen lands of, of the uh, Coast Salish people, specifically the couch and people. Um, and, um, and I'm just so grateful, uh, to be a visitor, um, on their, on their lands. Um, I think there's lots we can learn from, uh, how our colleagues from around the world um, uh, think about educating young people um, that, that we can learn from in the, in the uh, in, in, to add to the Western model or to help us reconsider the Western model. Um, so, so Alex, your question. Um, I think as a, as an educator, and I kind of fell into teaching and I'm not quite sure how I ended up sitting in my first classroom in August going, what just happened here? How, how did I get here? Um, I wanted young people that I was working with to have a 
uh, different kind of experiences than I tended to experience myself as a student. I, I wasn't a very happy student. I was quite successful. I learned to play the game. I was a pretty successful student. Uh, that took about, you know, a, a quarter of my brain and, and the rest was, was pretty much disengaged or engaged in other things that I found interesting and like to spend my time thinking about. Um, and I wanted a, a more fulsome uh, opportunity um, for young people to really develop and explore, you know, develop themselves and explore the world rather than just sort of it's Tuesday, turn to page 12. Mm. How, like, how old were you when you kind of connected those dots? Were you really young or were you already sort of into university? What was that path like? I'm always curious about how, how um, educators end up as educators. Well, how that happened is I, I graduated from UVic after, after an extended period of time there, uh, exploring <laughs> the, the, the wonders that UVic had to offer. Um, with half a degree in philosophy and a and a and because I realized part way along that you know you know there's not a lot of jobs for philosophers, um, so I became a, a geographer because there's way more work for geographers and uh, <laughs> um, and then I so I graduated and then I was sort of saying to my sisters I wonder hmm so I've graduated I should probably like get a job or something and um, they said oh are you going to be a teacher. And I went, and there, no, there are no educators in my family, no teachers. And I said, what? And they go, oh, no, we've always known you're going to, you'll be a teacher. Oh, my God. And so I went back to school and became a teacher, um, which was just kind of weird. So um, I, I'd had some, some different learning experiences as a young person, uh, a very privileged uh, set of opportunities that were given to me when I grew up in Ottawa. And it took me a while to realize that most kids didn't have the same opportunities that weren't given the same opportunities that I was. Mm -hmm. um, and that was um, disturbing to, to me as a, as a pretty young person to, to think, hmm, I'm allowed to do these, these you know, more exploratory, inquiry-based, pr pretty cutting-edge stuff back a thousand years ago. Um, starting in grade one um and and it's I, I just thought that's what every kid got and then when i realized that they didn't i was in sort of some special classes with specially selected classmates um and most other kids didn't didn't get to have the opportunities that that i had that was uh that was disturbing and then when those experiences kind of ended around you know in high school um that's when I, I I started to sort of connect up that it was there's better there's got to be better ways to do this. Yeah, I think Jeff, that that sort of sums up your central question, right? There's got to be a better way to do this. That's the whole why behind the the school. Yeah, I think it's interesting what Ron is saying because if you've had a taste of something that's you know that's good that works, and then you kind of realize that the 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 mainstream part of our system doesn't necessarily have all those ingredients in it in all of its bits and pieces it's uh sometimes it's very that's very limited um it seems strange when you're saying well this is good so why aren't we just doing the good things everywhere because <laughs> they're they're you know because there are places like like rod said where people don't have those opportunities and they would they don't think of school that way at all yeah and there's people you know there there are educators who go through their career and um they're okay with the way things are, or maybe they kind of feel the rub of, mm, it could be better, but there is a special, I don't know, is it a special allele or something that a person gets that makes them want to um, actually effect change. And so, um, Rod, I think you definitely had that allele, perhaps expressed double recessive. <laughs> um, and you, you, you were, you know, when you were working with the ministry, um, Jeff was casting his memory back. He thinks it was around about 2005. Um, and that was when you were bringing the new curriculum into being. Is that right? And that was that was a, a significant piece of uh, you reflecting what you think is important in education reform. Do you want to talk a little bit about that time? Um, no. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, the wounds are still healing. Yeah, I think... 
I've never been a very good rule follower. And that goes back to, to student days and teaching days and, and, and today days. Uh, I, I, I bristle when there's silly rules, um, either written or unwritten, but, but just sort of silly. And why do we do it that way? Well, just because, well, that's silly. Why do we have to do that? And my back kind of goes up. Um, so when I went to the ministry, um, it was not to, there was no reform or curriculum, anything on the horizon. That was not uh -oh. what I went for. I went for a very different job, which, as it turns out, was a, one of the first superintendents of achievement. And, and our task was, theoretically, to travel around the province and um, work with districts on their results and, and, and have conversations with, with their public in districts or, and senior staff and so on about why aren't you, you know, getting better results for your kids. Okay. Um, I didn't, that's, I didn't understand that when I signed up, when I signed up with Emery Dosdall, uh, who was the deputy minister at the time, it was, um, he phoned me one day and said, come, why don't you come work for me? And I said, doing what? He says, well, make, making things better for kids. That, that, that's, like, what I, that's what I signed up for. I went, okay, I, I can do that. I, I can help make things better for kids get down there um, and find out that it's as a superintendent of achievement. And, and, and so to be honest, so I actually never did that job and that's what I was supposed to do. I just, I just don't believe in embarrassing people or barking at them with authority to try to do better. But, but it, it gave me the privilege of traveling around the province and, and seeing every nook and cranny of this province. I've probably, if there's a school there, I've probably been in that community at some point. And, and 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 having a um, a conversation after conversation after conversation with educators around the province, and and that sort of got me thinking that yeah, there was an appetite to do some things differently. It wasn't government's appetite yet, but it, there was certainly an appetite in the system to to think to to, to think differently. Um, then. Uh, I guess it's deep enough in history. It's fine to talk about this. Uh, the, the, the premier of the day um, went to the deputy minister of the day and said, I think our kids aren't reading very well. Uh, we need to improve our reading. And so how about we fail kids in grade four? We retain them in grade four until they meet the reading standard. Um, and then the deputy of the day came to me as an educator a superintendent of achievement, an educator um, in the ministry, and there weren't a ton of actual educators in the ministry. Um, what I think about that, and I said, well, it's it's a dumb idea. It, like, he goes, well, because we'd kind of like you to write the policy. And I went, yeah, no, I, I won't, because it's a dumb idea. <laughs> oh, what could we do instead if we want to improve things? I said, well, let's look in the right end of the tube and let's, let's change everything. Let's, you know... Um, maybe what the kids are reading and why they're reading and all those things are part of why they're not too enthused about it. Let, let's actually try to make have, have our, our learning experiences be more engaging and, and get off curriculum coverage and, and all those kinds of things. And so we began a series of conversations around the province about that. And, and those were really fascinating. And, 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 and again, it was like Jeff kind of described it at the beginning. It was a, people go, seriously, could we do that? Like, could we? Wow. Uh, and some people were terrified, but lots of people were kind of intrigued. Well, what would it look like? Well, what, 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 what do you mean we try to have more learner agency or, or, or stop having 192 learning outcomes in grade two language arts? And, you know, like, what, what, what would we do? So those conversations were, were, were pretty fascinating. I had a chance to get to cabinet to sell sort of cabinet on on um, let's do something different. And, and they said, let's do it. And, um, and we kind of began the actual work of it. Um, and I think the, and I'm going way beyond your question, I apologize. But the, I think the, the how we did it was as important, if not more important than what we did. 
It was how we tried to engage educators from across the province, how we tried to uh, use it, teachers who were actually teaching to actually do, do the writing, to, uh, to do uh, all the conceptual work, to bring uh, First Nations, you know, if we really wanted to, to think differently about our First Nations learners, you know, th th some of those pieces needed to come in right at the very beginning of, of the design process. Um, it was a pretty exciting opportunity to rebuild some relationships mm -hmm. um, and, and, and to focus on those relationships with, with the Teachers Federation, with, with um, you know, Jeff talked about superintendents, principals, vice principals, parents, students, heaven forbids we should talk to students. Mm -hmm. um, Jeff was great in helping us out uh, to, to do that very early on. In fact, I was just looking at some some video the other day that we took, Jeff, with um, a couple of your students when you were on Gulf Islands that you brought over for a, a, a day and, and uh, we filmed some of that and, and uh, had some great conversations as they sort of spurred us along in the ministry those very early days of, well, then just change it. You're in charge, so make new rules. Like, I remember that. Like, that was fun. I remember yeah. um, kind of walking into the ministry and the kids being really intimidated, but I was also looking at the eyes of some of the people in the ministry offices and they looked a little scared too. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing bringing the, the client in? <laughs> it was pretty exactly. funny. Actually. Exactly. We had, we had a day that, that um, we took all the ministry staff over to St. Anne's Academy and we're sitting in the theater and Jeff, you came in with some of your students and, and some of the students described some the, the boat building experience and just some some profound learning experiences that these kids talked about that, that they were they were having. And then you talked about how difficult that was to actually make that work. So the people so the adults in the room all got hooked on. Yeah, we want that for all kids. That's really cool. And then you described how difficult that was and you led them perfectly. Uh, and then somebody from the audience says, well, how can we help get more of that? And you showed this stack of papers, get rid of all these rules. <laughs> and, and, and I think that was, that was a pivotal moment in the whole thing when folks in the ministry got the idea that they could actually change how education works. Um, so I want to jump in and Jeff just bulldoze me when you've got a thought, because I, I definitely don't want to just hear my own voice. Um, but Rod, we wanted to ask you about like, there's this piece around social license, right? And there's so much fear and worry about um, yeah, changing rules when it, it's, it's like pulling a tooth that really needs to come out and you don't want to do it and you don't want to do it and you're just afraid of what will happen when you do it. But after you do it, it's better. Will it talk a little bit about, um, yeah, you know, what are some of the barriers there and what are some of the ways we can sort of look at how can we put a perspective, take a perspective on creating change that will help us not be so hampered by that mm. um, piece of immovability? Yeah, I mean, you talked about social license and, and one of the things that we understood from the pretty early stages, I think from all those conversations that you know, we all had around in, in districts and in schools and around the province, um, was that we didn't just want a mechanical, this wasn't an improvement agenda. We weren't just trying to t tinker around the edges. We want, we needed a cultural shift in how we thought about schooling, how we thought about the grammar of the place called school and and how we approached it. It was a cultural shift that we wanted. And, and that's where this notion, where we start, sort of adopted this notion of social licenses. You, our, our belief was you, you, you don't have permission to do that without people giving it to you. You don't get to change culture without people giving you permission. Right. And, and you do that with them, not to them. You, from a ministry's perspective or a hierarchical perspective, you can create change by making a new rule and saying, now everyone has to follow this rule. And, you know, everybody down in the, down the pyramid starts to follow all the, all the rules. And, um, but that doesn't lead to cultural shift. That doesn't change the heart. 
that, that might change some some superficial practice. So if you want to actually change the heart, that ha people have to give you permission. You 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 build a collective permission to to do that. So we knew pretty pretty early on that what we wanted collectively was was a, a social change, a cultural shift, and how we thought about schools and how we went about the business of of um, of education or of educating our young folks. Um, and so that so we started to develop social license and use and use that language. Um, which is also a very empowering for the the groups because we you know um it's it's not well known but one of the one of the perks of being an assistant deputy minister is you get to ban words from the english language and so one of the words i banned was um a consultation so so i went to groups and said i i promise i will never consult with you um i need to know why tell me about this be, because consult often means we're checking a box. We've actually done the work. We've done the thinking. The curriculum's written. It's shrink wrapped. It's sitting in the basement. Now we're going to check the "did you consult" box, and so and so we say, "Here's what we've done. What do you think?" And we don't actually care what you think because we've already done it. Um, and that's the pessimistic view of consultation. But I think if you asked our First Nations colleagues, they would say that's how consultation has worked for them for the last you know several hundred years. Um, but we said we co-construct. We will build with you from the beginning and co-construct the curriculum, co-construct co that work, um, as opposed to consult. We're not going to do it in the basement and then run it by you later. We're going to build together from the beginning and we're going to have those, those big knockdown drag them out arguments all the way along. Um, so one of the ways that we, that we tried to do that was uh, to say to people that came in on writing teams, and that's it, it's not a new concept to have teachers come in from around the province and 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 sit and work on writing teams, but typically they would they would have a non disclosure agreement of some kind where they agree they're not going to talk about anything until it gets published, and and we said just the opposite. You need to promise you're going to when you come down for a few days and you do some writing, that when you go back to your school you're going to tell everybody what you did. And you're going to tell people what you're arguing about. And you're going to tell people, well, you're not sure about the balance between um, content and process in social studies. That was a, that was a brawl, that one. Some, <laughs> some folks said social studies should all be process. Others said, oh, well, you know, what about history and content? And it's important they know facts. And, 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 it, and it was a fist fights going on in there. It was great. Mm -hmm. um, he said, go have those in your staff rooms when you go back and then bring that intel back when you come back in, you know, a couple of months later for the next round. What is it that the people you've been talking to are saying? Because we wanted to, to really bring that, that um, knowledge from, you know, the 42,000 teachers in the province and not just the, the few that get to come on the writing teams. Um, so we wanted that process to be open and transparent. Um, and we wanted to be able to demonstrate that when we heard new things and and we learned as a as teams um that would impact what we did and um we started to hear the you know terms like oh you mean draft means draft because we would put out drafts that were that were drafts and and some folks from government didn't like that because we were putting out stuff that was half-baked Right, because because that, that's the point of a draft. <laughs> Is you put it out early enough, it can be changed when people go, "Hey, have you thought about this or what about that?" And um, and so that notion of oh, draft means draft. Yeah, draft means draft. It, and each each iteration gets a little bit tighter because we, you know, we're um, landing a little more clearly on on where we want to be. But um, yeah, so that notion of social license, of transparency of co-construction was all part of the build. And so it's difficult then to, to uh, knock something that you've had a part in creating, mm -hmm. um, which, which helps ultimately with implementation. Another word that I got to ban, but anyway. That's classic. Uh, people need to be brought in, not bought in, right? Getting, yeah. Yeah, getting all the feedback right in there at the beginning. Jeff, you're bursting. What what is it? What is the thought in your head? <laughs> I was just thinking about a bunch of things. I'm just remembering that that process, and it was it was 
completely different from what we usually experience with the ministry where it was we're coming in to talk to you about the new policy that's coming down we want to know what you think of it before we do it to you i was like well why why would i want to participate in that as opposed to you know this is a draft what do you think what can we add what can we change what's terrible about it what's good about it it was so it was really refreshing mm -hmm. what i found interesting is that it um actually leveraged a lot of the really good professional development kinds of things that have been happening around the province for the last few decades where you know we went through this phase where it was all about assessment we did every, everything was about assessment 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 and then oh that flavor's over now now it's a new week let's try the new flavor and it's going to be about um you know uh, approaches to reading and then we just kept we just kept changing the flavor um all of those things were good but they all needed to be together and all of a sudden there was this conversation that was talking about culture and all of those professional development topics had a had like a, a like a shared context and they fit into something finally so you could just see people coming and bringing in their favorite stuff that they thought had disappeared because it mattered again and it could plug into this larger conversation it was, it was you know very exciting and and yeah that building um thing is a really good psychological phenomenon called the ikea effect which is that when you uh build your own furniture you like it more that because you built it uh, is that right? you'll, con you'll even convince yourself that you like it because you built it so <laughs> you've got sweat equity right in there yeah <laughs> right in big right in yep yep little wrenches and everything <laughs> I like that. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna use those. Um and those wrenches no often known as Allen keys. So you know that's oh. that's right up my alley, right? That's so. right oh up my gosh. That's great. <laughs> um, all right. So I want to ask a, a tough question. If if all this magic happened uh, a few years back, that it feels like we're not there yet. What's happening? Like how how did this beautiful um co-created, I like that word so much, um change you know this vision for what we can actually offer to children how why aren't we there yet both or either of you <laughs> um that's a five beer conversation one that jeff and i have had a few times um <laughs> yeah. well and i don't know that it's a matter of being there I, I think it's still the journey and i think and i think we're still on the journey it's a long and winding road it's not a super highway uh, I think there's things we could have done and and they and and could be happening now to speed things up but but when you're talking about a cultural shift it's not just learning a new assessment practice and then you do it a couple of times and you get better at it you know that's an improvement agenda and and we understand how improvement works better than we understand how innovation works or how cultural shift works and so uh it takes a while for cultures to shift it takes a like our teacher pre-service needed to catch up desperately to where folks were moving to in the field um and and that takes a while and some institutions are perhaps faster at it than others but but it that that takes a while to to shift those models um so so i think i think it's it's happening. I, I think people underestimated how long it was going to take because they sort of thought, well, you know, like Jeff said, you, we, we like Christmas trees, something new and shiny will pop up, you know, assessment for learning. Oh, we did that last year. That's so, if you know, that's so last year, let's move on to something else. Um, it's sort of how education's gone for a long time here in the West. And, um, so we thought we we're going to stick at this for five or six years. That's got to be long enough. And it's not like I, I remember distinctly and I've got a couple of slides and stuff that I used to do, you know, every time there'd be a new minister of education. And I think I worked for five, I think. Wow. Um, the, the, one of the first questions would be, so how long will this take? A couple of years? And, and I'd say 15 years, 20 years. Oh, we don't, you know, we don't have that kind of time. So I started shifting to a Judy and Linda answer. Um, when kids leave our school as curious as when they arrive, that then we'll know we're there. That that's when we'll know, you know, they, they should be more curious when they leave us, not less curious when they come in in kindergarten. Um, and people would kind of scoff at that and go, well, that's 
That's crazy. Let's let's just make a rule. Let's just make people do this. And you can't make people do it. Um, they have to figure it out for themselves. And and so we're asking teachers to teach in a way and, and assist them to 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 um, support those teachers do things in a way that they didn't experience themselves as learners. Mm -hmm. They haven't been gone to university and learned that stuff necessarily either. So that all takes time. Um, I, I think we could speed things up by um, continuing to be clear that that's the direction that we're wanting to travel. I think we are learning uh, increasingly th through through efforts across the province, sc schools like PSII has have led the way on this, but but there's little there's little glimmers elsewhere around the province um, as well. What the policy, the enabling policy framework should be to support th this direction. Um, w one of the things that we well, along with cultural shift is. You know the, the belief that policy should be enabling not 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 negatively based well somebody broke did something bad we'll make a policy so that never happens again it doesn't work very well we want policy that enables the right things to be more likely to happen rather than tries to stop all the bad things um because you can't think of all the bad things <laughs> you know there's lots of weirdness that can happen but how do we enable the kinds of things to happen that we want to have ha have happen and so our belief, and we had a brilliant deputy minister for a few years uh, who helped me understand this, is that policy should be behind. Let's not change the policy. He'd say, let's get people doing the kinds of things that we want them to do, mm -hmm. see how that looks, and then we can write policy that enables and supports that. So we, so, so using a, 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 an enabling supportive policy framework. And we started down that road and I think we sort of drifted off that a little bit. I, I think we could be continuing through policy shifts mm -hmm. to continue to enable um, innovation, continue to enable uh, and make it easier for schools like Jeff's to exist, make it easier for um, different unique learning environments to, to, happen, to happen more easily in our system so we can learn from them. Yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned that um, deputy minister, because that, that comment that you made really resonated with me as well. The idea of, um, you know, letting people do the things and then build the policy, like just following up behind them kind of thing. That actually was a fairly large part of the impetus for starting the school, which was, um, mm. okay, that's a good idea. And I, I also think, you know, what, and I know you found this too, Rod, that sometimes people found that, um, because it's about culture and it wasn't about rules, they would notice that there was room inside our existing system to do an awful lot of the things or at least kind of move in the right direction before you hit the edge. You could go pretty, quite a long way often from where you had been in your, in your practice as a, like an educational culture, even within the existing framework. And so people started to do that movement and are still doing it. Some people are really far away from the edge. They still have a ways to go before they bump up against the, yeah. you know, the border. So there is motion. Um, but I do hope that, I think you're right, I do hope that, um, you know, the modeling is helping people see what's possible. That's what we're trying to do. And then that someone's watching and saying, okay, now we see where the policy needs to go. And it does, it does feel like we've kind of taken a little, a little, maybe a little rest stop on the, on that meandering road or that super highway just on that front, just for a little while. But fair enough, there's been a few things that have, you know, kind of got in the way, um, you know, fairly large distractors. Um, I do think there will always be distractors and I do hope that we're always able to overcome them. <laughs> but uh, there've been a lot, few really big ones the last couple of years. There have, I mean, the pandemic for sure has just been a shit show for everybody. But, you know, I, I my conviction is that the more, um, the more we get it together and really organize things well for children, you know, like the, that that's an investment that never actually um, is the wrong investment, right? So it's like, if you look at all the, you know, Gov plays whack-a-mole, bless their hearts, right? Um, and our society plays whack-a-mole. We have all these problems that crop up and we try and address them. And like Rod's saying, sometimes it's through policy or sometimes it's just through, um, 
programs, but really if we take two steps back and look at the things, the big levers, Jeff, one of your notes here for today's conversation was the levers for change. One of the biggest levers for change is, um, yeah, shifting away from uh, the approach we've taken in schools, which as Rod noted, sort of dampens down children's curiosity and a lot of other things. Um, you know, if we just sort of reorient and reorganize the way schooling works, uh, that would make a huge difference in addressing these other things that keep bumping up and getting in the way and, and causing problems for government to deal with. Like it, I don't, I don't want to, yeah, the word short-sighted is floating around in my mind. And that's a human thing, right? Certainly not just a gov thing, but we need to, we need to recognize when a model is working. And I, think of, I, th I think of it like a uh, Alfred Hitchcock movie where the camera is really like closed in and, it, and you feel like a sense of suspense or dread because you want to see yeah. outside the edges. Um, yeah. and, and I think sometimes as a society, as a government, as everything, we, we are so focused on the thing we're looking at. And there's all these things around the edges that are actually extremely important um, that and we just have to like do that with the, with the you know, the, the the lens so that we can see you know see a little bit more and see how things connect together i mean if your safe schools practices is culturally counter to what you're trying to do with learning you're going to you're going to be in, have a tough spot you have to consider all the all the elements at the same time and they all kind of need to be consistent culturally yeah i, I mean so, so many so many great points just made it um what one of the, one of the quotes, Jeff? I'm I'm sure it's yours. I attribute it to you anyway. Um, so well, good. <laughs> I, um, is that? Uh, and I I see a picture in my head, but but uh, and it's about uh, you know, unfortunately, lots of people huddle on the brown grass even after you remove the box. So so it's about you know let's 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 remove the box, and people tend to huddle on the brown grass where the box used to be, which is that, that you know it it's not that's cultural shift and it takes a while for people to to uh, have the courage or the comfort level to, to 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 shift practice but you're right we had a we had a thing going um this was with minister abbott back in those days uh, and I, we had an official name for it but we used to call it the get out of jail free cards and whereas if you if there was a rule or a policy that got in the way of you trying to do something you, you could you could tell us in the ministry and we'd and we give you a get out of jail free card. In fact, Minister Abbott actually wanted some cards printed up, looked like the, the Monopoly card that he could go around and actually physically hand to people. Uh, but 90% of the stuff that came in, we went back and said, you've already got permission to do that. There, nothing's stopping you. It's culture that's stopping you. It's your beliefs about how schools should operate that's stopping you. It's not, it's not actually a rule or a policy. So, so to, to that point, uh, absolutely true. And, and Alex, you mentioned the pandemic, and I think one of the things that the pandemic has hopefully done for us, and, and I'm going to use your Hitchcock, you know, that, that tight lens, is it's actually broadened the lens. We, we're being forced to see things that we were able to ignore or just didn't see before. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, we've always had inequities in our schools. So that's, that's nothing new and in our society. It's just so blatant now with COVID. You can't ignore it. You, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God. How did we not know this? Well, we knew it. We just we could, 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 could ignore it somehow. And, um, and so my hope is that the pandemic has, has, has broadened that lens you know the shot so that so that we're we're able to you know that when we come back in september we're not coming back to the same old same old we're, we're gonna we're gonna use what we've learned i mean i think that the pandemic has been a i don't think it's been a transformative event I, I think it's been a traumatic event it could be transformative if we use what we've learned the right to to actually transform things not just in education but in all kinds of social policy areas well said, actually, I, that it's not a transformative event. And, you know, like eight months ago, we couldn't have said that. But now we can now we can kind of agree that, oh, that was a massive speed bump. 
However, it didn't quite flip us upside down <laughs> enough to really make all the shifts. Yeah, it's an evolution, not a revolution, right? That's what we say at Roy Group, all of this. Yeah. Or, or, or revolution through evolution, right? I mean, you, you get, you, you, you yeah. ultimately you get to something different. Um, or if we go really software, it's a revolution through iteration. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah, no, Jeff and I talk a lot about the pandemic and how it has sparked a lot of big conversations. You know, I, I'm on Twitter, Jeff is on Twitter, and Jeff, you're also you have your ear to the ground. Well, you do too, Rod. Both of you are still deeply, deeply involved in education. And there's some really good conversations happening. You know, the, the hunger, the appetite for, even if people don't know what they think the answer is, they are hungry for something different. And that's heartening because we all know, and Jeff, you did a master's in this, um, you know, when you're, when you have intrinsic low, um, motivation and an in, internal locus of control, you feel like the things that you do actually matter and you, you can pursue a path that, uh, no one else is telling you to pursue. You just know that it's actually the right thing to do. So we have to trust that all that, those little energy bits are bubbling around inside teachers and learners and parents oh my gosh parents right there's so much that's happening now that the pandemic has given us as a gift sure. Rod, you know, oh sorry go ahead. Say, we, we um one of the terms that, that we used for a while was zugenrua this this german term for um um uh, herd restlessness so just before the wildebeests or you know migrate there's sort of this general restlessness that they're they're not sure where they want to go but something that but they kind of don't want to be where they are and it's this unfocused restlessness and and the germans love to have a word for everything and, and so zug and rua uh, migratory restlessness um and i think we were there a while back we were and, and that's kind of the state of the province i think back when we began these conversations 2005 or whenever whenever that was people didn't know where they wanted to go but they knew they there was something wrong with where they were mm -hmm. um and even if they couldn't articulate or put their finger on it so i think now we move forward 10 years or 15 years or whatever it is um i i think there's a more of a consensus around the direction but i think it's people are still struggling of trying to figure out how to get there mm -hmm. There's some enablers in, in place. The curriculum's enabler. It's not a driver. It doesn't force you to do anything, but it enables you to do lots of things. So it's an enabling policy. It's an, it's an enabler. And there's lots of enablers out there, um, but it's still up to folks to, to, to do it. So I think there's still, there's, we're out of Zugenrua, but maybe we haven't quite started to migrate yet. <laughs> or, or we're just in those early stages of migration. We're not we kind of know where we want to go. Um, in fact, I'd say it's firmer than that. We know where we want to go. We're just struggling with how to get there. Yeah. Yeah. As a system. Yeah. And, and there's lots of, lots, lots of wildebeest like Jeff that are, you know, sort of out front, out front of the pack. Um, I, want to, I want to ask about that too, because you, you have, uh, Jeff talks about your involvement in the deeper learning dozen. What is this thing? What is this deeper learning dozen and and is it it connected to this heartfelt desire for change? Uh, yep, a deeper learning dozen is a is a is a uh, it, it stems from Harvard Graduate School of Education, so it's a Harvard project mm -hmm. with um, Jal Meda is the prof at Harvard who is sort of uh, the brainiac behind it. And Joel's written a lot about deeper learning and, and um, which I think in BC, we call transformative learning or something. We'd sort of use that word transformational. It's similar. Um, and so what Joel wanted to do, I hate to put words in his mouth because he's way better at putting his own words in his own mouth, but <laughs> was to look at some, like, it was hard to just, you sort of know it when you see it, but you're not quite sure how it, how it happens and what's the magic and the secret sauce. So mm -hmm. he wanted to look at some districts who seem to have something going on. They seem to be on that journey. 
And then instead of saying, oh, well, I'm a writer, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an educational guru at Harvard, I'll write some books on it. And here's, here's the five steps to Nirvana. He said, uh, let's look at some places that seem to have something going on and we'll study them and we'll see what we learn about how the, these transformations happen. So it's very much sort of a, a more action research oriented kind of a kind of an approach. Um, and I met Jal through some work I was doing at Harvard and through a, a, a colleague, Amelia Peterson, who Jeff knows from, from uh, uh, lots of days in, in, in Gelp. Uh, she was, a, she was a, in, in Gelp. Um, and Amelia was doing her doctorate uh, with Jal and, uh, and said, when I was in Boston one time, she said, you know, you, you guys need to meet. So we had this, had this chat. Deeper Learning Dozen was born. And um, eight, 12 districts, eight from the US, four from British Columbia, that seem to have something happening. And it's been three years now that we've been working with those districts. We're about to expand and, and take on some more districts. Mm -hmm. um, no one involved would say, aha, we've got it. We can write the book on how to do this. It's, it's really still uh, from a district perspective, not a school perspective, but from a district perspective, how do you uh, increase the likelihood that kids are going to have deeper learning experiences mm -hmm. or transformative learning experiences? So that's DLD. DLD. And you said Gelp. You mentioned Gelp. And I don't think, Jeff, in the introduction to Rod, you mentioned GELP. Um, you always giggle about, well, you don't giggle, but you roll your eyes at the acronym. But it's, it's the best acronym in the business. I know. It's like, what is this? GELP. Nope. Global <laughs> Education <laughs> Learning Project? Uh, leaders Partnership. Leaders par leadership Partnership or something like that. Yeah. This is what happens when I write the acronym, but not the thing. Okay. So now, Arad, are you still involved in, in GELP? Y yes. Um, yeah. Gelp has shifted um, its model, uh, partly due to the pandemic, but also um, it's shifted its model hmm. um, of how it was trying to support global change. A um, whole variety of reasons there, likely, but um, it still exists and is still doing some pretty cool things. There's some great people engaged with Gelp. Towards the end, I think Gelp was heading the same way that DLD um, it has gone, which is looking at some innovative systems. And Jeff, I think you came to New York and right, and, and we looked at a bunch of schools in New York City, and yeah. um, and some of them were pretty cool and innovative, and some of them were like, "Wow, you're calling that innovative?" Like, ooh. Um, <laughs> but what I loved about Gelp and still do is it brings some really interesting people together for some really interesting conversations and, and, and from a, from a more global perspective, folks, what's, what's going on in India right now that, that we should be looking at in, in some of the, the work that's happening there and, and so on. And it's, uh, I also work for the OECD. And, and so that also help helps bring a global perspective, for sure. which always makes me come home and go, man, I love being in BC. Okay. Well, why? Where, where it's at. Really? Okay. Yeah, for sure. I think we're, we, we continue to be the envy of the world as an education system. I think what's going on in this province is, 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 abs is seen as being absolutely world-class. I've heard this. I've heard, you know, people, people talk about Finland and people talk about Sweden and there's a few other places, but British Columbia is, is often um, in that conversation. I think right now the two the two wonder kids of of education globally um, um, for much of the world that much of the world aspires to be like um, and I take out you know, Singapore is amazing but Singapore is Singapore and it's not really a, a, you, you've got to be in Singapore to 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 do what they do um, and and a few you know Shanghai which you know that that little sort of area and, and so on but it, uh, british columbia and estonia are, are are two places that that are quite similar in lots of ways uh taking some some different approaches um we just had some big oecd meetings last week or the week before last that were in estonia uh, pandemically 
uh, we were all visited schools virtually and, and took a look at what's going on there. But, you know, they've been um, right at the top of the, of the PISA league tables. Uh, not that that's the be all and end all, but it's, but it is an indicator um, for a bit and doing some really interesting work around student agency, student agency, student choice, um, uh, competencies and so on. Estonia, that's the first time Estonia has come into my head as as being a, an educational like a model right that people are looking to and learning from this is pretty cool what does well, Singapore work I like these global things are so interesting because it's like um Rushworth Kidder's work when he did his whole um uh looking at what kinds of value systems do people have around the world like are they the same or are they not the same and you sort of find out they're all the same um everyone has different contexts but there's some really big kind of value pieces about society and how education fits with society that are pretty much give or take all the same everywhere you go and everyone just has a different way of kind of getting at it so it's sort of yeah. it's nice to have those international conversations yeah for sure um in a nutshell what's the what's what does singapore do that is so great well i think they have um their if you, if you think about education as a graphic equalizer <laughs> yeah. and, and, and you want to play with the dials to make sure that you're getting exactly the right sound, Singapore has got an amazing graphic equalizer. They control the, com the complete educational chain from start to finish. They predict they're going to need 10 more science teachers, uh, ph physics teachers in three years. Oop, three more, 10 more physics teachers pop out in three years. They, they have complete um, and that sounds Machiavellian. It's not really Machiavellian, but but just complete oversight over the entire learning ecosystem there. That's extraordinary. Yeah. Really in. Nothing's left to chance. <laughs> no, nothing <laughs> is left to chance. There is a rule for everything, um, yes. and and everything is quite structured. But but they're also they do a lot of really creative learning uh, happening there. But it's again, we want more creativity, we'll dial up create creativity, right? Like it's not nothing by chance, not, nothing just on the whim of a teacher. Well, I'm heartened to hear that British Columbia is, uh, is getting the thumbs up. That's fantastic. Maybe it's our, uh, I don't know, there must be something fairly progressive in the water here. The, the curriculum is seen as, as sort of the global um, benchmark standard high water mark I, I think pe people aspire to that yeah um uh i've been doing some work in latvia that you know they're they're working uh, on trying to recreate not, not recreate because that has to be contextual but taking a lot of the learning from british columbia you know how we try to have, have integrated competencies try to um J Jal's term uh marie kondo the curriculum you know like if it doesn't bring you joy, toss it out. We don't need a zillion discrete learning outcomes. We can raise the altitude and, and stick with bigger ideas. The concept of big ideas is is catching on around the world. The, the, the idea that we want student agency um, and to get to student agency, you have to have teacher agency. And to get to teacher agency, you have to have school agent. Like you, you, mm -hmm. those are, aren't things that you have to release control, not tighten control oh, yeah. um, if you're nodding and so lots of the world is playing with that although there there's you know there's large parts of the world that struggle with that concept as well true this could be another uh, several podcasts to go into each of these questions because they're they're pretty deep they go they're deep wells for sure i want to i want to get one where i where i just listened to the two of you talk about the value of actual formalized curriculum i want to go there sometime <laughs> that would be fun. Yeah, yeah I know Jeff. That would, that would be fun. Jeff is no shrinking violet when it comes to the must dos uh, on a child's to do list. Um, but you know, Rod, this has been amazing. You've you have um, opened uh, shone a light into some corners that I haven't really spent a lot of time examining. Very cool to um, talk with you after having heard about you for such a long time from Jeff, um, and I can see how each of you fire each other's neurons and I can see those five beer conversations have probably <laughs> have probably 
giving you each lots to think about. So this yeah, well, was I think we became new superintendents or, or superintendents around the same time, I think. 90. Yeah. I, I, I think, and, and um, yeah, you go to those big superintendent meetings and being the, the young kids on the block sort of going, mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know, are you buying all this stuff or can we do something different? Or yeah, it was, it was. I think I even got fun. yelled at by Emery one time for saying something. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's when I knew I had made it. <laughs> Can't remember what I said, but uh, yeah. didn't like it too much. <laughs> yeah, you probably did. Yeah, you probably did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh well. Way to go, Jeff. You're not one to mince your words, anyways. So. <laughs> not usually. I don't, I don't go out of my way to offend, but still. <laughs> no, but but I did take. I don't know how many ministers, but several ministers. You know, early on in their tenure, up. We, you know, say, let's walk up the block to go, go pop in to see what, what Jeff's doing to, um, to sort of give new ministers a conceptual pick uh, some pictures in their heads of what we're kind of talking about in terms of, of, of what's possible in, in learning to transfer, you know, transform learning kinds of experiences for kids. And cause I think a lot of them, you know, we, you know, we, we all have our own memories and experiences and that's what we base are thinking on and so it's true. Um, I think it was Minister Fassbender he had a Q&A <laughs> yep. with the kids yep sort of this impromptu Q&A <laughs> yep <laughs> he's going those kids were well prepared it's not really <laughs> no not at all actually <laughs> there you, they you, we just kind of walked in the door and uh, and uh <laughs> but yeah it was it was always helpful to have have Jeff sort of down the road to to um spur our thinking in the ministry and with staff and and also to and to provide then and to continue to provide those kinds of see this is possible we, we can do this um, we, and, and i think jeff you miss that don't you i mean you you miss actually you know when rod was there um there was there were people coming and visiting and uh you know policymakers and thinkers were coming and watching and yeah they you know, observing you want they, that they still come i mean the the universities come uh, we see more people from outside of bc now than inside actually um but we uh, but we you know we do see we still see people from the ministry quite a bit i haven't seen a minister for a little while two, for two ministers but i do think they've had they've had their hands full and i've, I've had a had a deputy minister in a, a few times just recently yeah. which is nice so, um, yeah, but no, it's good. I mean, it's, it is really, it's fun for us too, to, it helps us to talk about what we're doing when someone asks a question that has no, does not have this experience. And we have to think of how to describe it to somebody, because when you just look at it, you just go, it's kids in a room and they're doing, they're doing stuff. Like it's hard to see what's mm -hmm. happening until you start the conversation. So it's helpful to have people in who don't really kind of know what we're up to so that we're able to make ourselves think of how to explain it to people. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to do. Yeah. You almost don't need to provide the director's cut, you know, <laughs> and what they're yeah. doing now is yeah, sort of the behind yeah, the scenes. That's right. That's right. A narrator in behind. That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Jeff, do you have any closing thoughts, sentiments, questions, dark areas, dark corners to illuminate? <laughs> <laughs> Sentiment, I guess, would just be to, to thank Rod for, for doing this. And um, I know that there's, uh, I don't know, just the, the, wealth, the wealth of experience, the, the fact that you invented your own job to be able to bring so much to um, the education system, but to the people in it, the kids in BC um, is truly remarkable. And it's kind of interesting because it's sort of the model for what we want people to do in the system as well, which is don't squander the freedom that you actually have you know, take it as far as you can. And that in itself should guide people um, in, when they're trying to get, take a, you know, a measure of the culture. If you watch people in the direction they're going, it, it lets you know which way we, we seem to want to go. So I, I just really appreciate the work you did and I appreciate you talking about it today. Well, thanks, Jeff it, it, and Alex. It's, it's always fun to, uh, to reminisce. And we, we didn't even talk about our colleague, John Abbott and, you know, who's a, you know, a, a, a uh, icon for both of us, I, th I think, and a friend, and um, yes. uh, you know, so 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 much so much to talk about, but but always fun to 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 think about the work that we've 
collectively accomplished in this province, and it has been a collective enterprise. Um, folks playing different roles, but but uh, needing everyone's efforts to uh, to do it, and and so that's why I'm confident it's going to continue. It just might take a little longer right now, but but um, there's a lot of really committed people to this work. Yeah, iteration in the revolution. So yes, good like to have this space with both of you, and maybe we'll do a reprise. That would be nice. That would be awesome. Thank you both. <laughs> Thank thanks you. very much. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks.